13 years ago, in this very room, my prayer was simple on graduation day of 2009. Lord, may I not fall up those steps. And 13 years later, I just prayed that same prayer. So I am uh, very grateful to be here. This is um, one of the greatest honors um, I've ever had in my life, um, to come home and to be in this place. Dr. Muller, thank you so much for the gracious invitation. Um, thank you, nearly 30 years ago, you didn't just do something, you stood there and in this very room. And we have the opportunity to be in this place, to gather together, to worship and to hear the scriptures and to believe the truth and to stand for the truth based upon the leadership of the Lord and Dr. Alan Moeller. And for that, my brother, I'm grateful and truly thankful. As a graduate of this institution, the Billy Graham School, um, I'm thankful to see so many professors and great leaders, uh, not only in this seminary, but in the Southern Baptist Convention uh, and on the front row, which is a blessing for me right now. So it's good to see all of you. We're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 2 this morning. So if you will take your copy of God's Word and go to Nehemiah chapter 2. And as you're turning there to the scriptures, I just want to bring greetings on behalf of Ohio Baptist, the 700 plus churches in Ohio. And uh, we have a great need. Ohio is the seventh most populated state in America. My prayer is that we will not be relevant just every four years in an election cycle, but that we would see a great movement and an awakening of God upon our churches in our state that would have a ripple effect throughout the nation. And so I want you to know if you are thinking about ministry and planting and revitalization, we would love to have you pray and consider coming to Ohio. Um, there's a great need, seventh most populated state. And also Columbus is the 14th largest city in America. And so um, we just would love for you to pray. We are actually uh, reallocating and changing our budget for the state convention. Uh, opening up more resources for church planting throughout our state, replanting, revitalization. And so I would love to have a conversation with you in the days ahead. If you would, if you've come this far north, maybe an hour and a half more, up 71, and you'll cross into Ohio and uh, see the great Bengal Stadium and just see the great need in Ohio. We'd love to, to have you talk and pray through that as well. Nehemiah chapter 2. And this morning, I want to talk to you about the secret sauce of ministry the secret sauce of ministry. The book of Nehemiah uh, begins 15 years after the book of Ezra ends, almost 100 years after the first captives came back to the promised land, and some 150 years after the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. After this long time, the walls of the city of Jerusalem were still in rubble. Before this, the citizens of Jerusalem had tried to rebuild the walls, but they had failed. And in Ezra 4, we see that some 75 years before they tried to rebuild the walls, but they were stopped by their enemies. No one thought this obstacle could be overcome, so the walls lay in ruin and the people stayed in trouble. And that's where we find ourselves here in our text, Nehemiah chapter 2. Would you please stand for the reading of God's holy, inerrant, infallible, inspired word? Nehemiah chapter 2 verses one through eight. And the scripture says, during the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was set before him, I took the wine and I gave it to the king. And I had never been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, why are you sad when you aren't sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. I was overwhelmed with fear and replied to the king, may the king live forever. Why should I not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king asked me, what is your request? So I prayed to the God of the heavens and answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servants found favor with you, send me to Judah and the city where my ancestors are buried so that I may rebuild it. The king with the queen seated beside him asked, how long will your journey take and when will you return? So I gave him a definite time and it pleased the king to send me. I also said to the king, if it pleases the king, let me have letters written to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates River, so they will grant me safe passage until I reach Judah. And let me have a letter written to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so that he will give me timber to rebuild the gates of the temple's fortress, the city wall, and the home where I will live. And the king granted my request, for the gracious hand of my God was upon me. 
Would you pray with me in this moment? Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. May we leave this place more in love than how we entered with you. Rivet our hearts. Remind us of the truth of the gospel today and the call upon our lives. May we seek you and you alone in this life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I simply want to share with you my journey, my church planting journey of what the Lord did in and through my life with you from this text. 10 weeks ago, New Year's Eve, the top three most searched phrases on Google, number one was get healthy. Number two was get organized. The third most searched phrase on Google on New Year's Eve was how to get the most out of life. The truth is, Ecclesiastes chapter three says, God has placed eternity on the hearts of all men. People are searching and they are scratching, looking for truth and for hope and for help and for answers. And you and I, if we are redeemed, if we are saved, we have the answers. We are ambassadors of reconciliation. People are always looking in times of transition, in times of tension, and in times of turbulence, people are asking and looking for hope and for help. Several years ago, I was preaching out west at a conference, flying back to Ohio, because as a pastor, Sunday comes really fast. And as a church planning pastor, it really comes fast. And so I was on the plane on Delta preparing my sermon for the day. And uh, the pilot said, listen, we're going to go through Chicago. I don't like flying through Chicago because it always results in turbulence and issues. And so we had to go through O'Hare. And the pilot said, hey, there's going to be no, uh, no drinks, no snacks, no service. Just sit down and buckle your seatbelt. And I thought, wow, this is going to be a great time. And so I got on the plane. And Dr. Moeller is a good church planner in Ohio. I wore all the Ohio State stuff, okay? I know we're the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. We do have this school in Ohio called The Ohio State University. And so are there any Ohio students in the house this morning? I forgot to do that. Are there any students from Ohio? I see a few of you. There you go. You can yell out OH, it's okay. I know it's chapel, but we're all Buckeyes here. And I was wearing the scarlet and gray on the plane and uh, I mean, it was probably kind of ridiculous. I had the Ohio State shirt, I had the pants, I even had Ohio State shoes on. I mean, it was kind of over the top. And, um, and I got on the plane and a lady turned around to me as I got on the plane and she said, sir, uh, are you a coach for Ohio State? And I said, uh, no ma'am, uh, I'm not. She goes, well, who are you? And I said, I'm just a church planner in Marysville, Ohio. She said, oh. I thought you were somebody important. <laughs> and then she turned around and I thought, wow, there's a nice slice of humble pie to get on the flight. And, um, and so about an hour into the journey, um, it got a little, there's turbulence and then there's turbulence. And uh, we were going up and down pretty far and people were starting to feel a little nauseous. And all of a sudden the laptops were closing, the iPads were shutting off and people began to fold their hands. And that lady an hour later turned around to me and she said, excuse me, son, did you say you were a pastor? <laughs> and I said, yes, ma'am, the one that's not important, that's me. She said, uh, well, are you praying? I said, yes, ma'am, I'm praying. She said, well, I'm praying that God's not done with you on this earth yet. And uh, I said, well, I appreciate that, ma'am. People are always looking for hope in times of, of turbulence. See, the reality is, People are asking the question, what is the secret sauce of life? How do I get the most out of this life? And even young seminarian students, even those in the ministry are always asking the question, how do I maximize my ministry? How do I get the most out of my time on this side of eternity? And what is the secret sauce? Is it finding the right network? Is it getting the right degree? Is it having the most influence on social media? What is it that I really have to have to have an impact on this side of eternity to get the most out of my ministry? What's the secret sauce, Jeremy? And the reality is, Nehemiah is gonna show us there really is no secret. But some things had to happen in Nehemiah's life. This is a miraculous story. Great sermons have been preached from this pulpit, from Nehemiah 4 and 6 and other chapters. Nehemiah is known as one of the greatest leaders of all time. Great books have been written, sermons have been preached, lectures have been talked about with Nehemiah. But Nehemiah 2, to me, is a great little passage that's miraculous. 
that tells us, I believe, some things that God did in Nehemiah's life that I saw God do in my life, and I pray he would do in all of our life when it comes to ministry. Number one, God saw that he could trust Nehemiah. God saw that he could trust him. Before there's a Nehemiah 2, there's a Nehemiah chapter 1. You say, well, thank you, Captain Obvious, I knew that. But the reality is we love activity. We love going and doing. But the truth of the matter is we see a great story in what God did in Nehemiah's life, but before there's activity for God, there must first be intimacy with God. We're so busy going and doing, which is great, but before we go and do, we must be. We must be with the Father. We must spend time. And we're tempted in seminary to just always be in the text, always be in the book for reading and preaching and writing. But are we in the text? Are we in the book for our own souls? And who is our chief shepherd? Who is the one shepherding us on a daily basis? It's easy to drift. It's easy to drift. I love Florida. I love the past five years in Florida. People say, who lived and ministered in Clearwater, Florida and left and went back to Columbus, Ohio. I did, right? Because you go where God sends you. Even if it snows, you go where God sends you. And it's easy to drift, but I love Florida because one of the things I loved about Florida is you would go out to the ocean and you would look up 30 minutes later and all of a sudden you couldn't find your condo. What had happened? You had drifted and you didn't even know it. Nehemiah shows us here in chapter one the importance of intimacy. If you go back to chapter one, look at the first four verses, the Bible says that Nehemiah had heard about the walls in Jerusalem. He had a report. Interesting, Nehemiah was born in exile. He had heard about Jerusalem. No doubt God may be calling some of you to a city, to a land where you have only heard about but not seen. That was my case. I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. And out of that, God called me to move to Marysville, Ohio in 2008 to plant a church. I had never really heard about uh, Marysville, Ohio. Never knew it existed. But God in his sovereignty had placed many things together for us to go and to move. But God saw that he could trust Nehemiah. He hears about the walls. And what does the Bible say in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4? What does Nehemiah do? He doesn't run to a, a slick campaign and a marketing scheme. What does Nehemiah do? He weeps and he prays and he fasts can ask you a question this morning, whether you're watching online or you're in this room today, when's the last time you wept and you prayed and you fasted? When's the last time you didn't treat the Lord like a drive through where you just kind of, I want this, I want that, I want this, and then we're on our way. God, I want this grade, I want that, I want this position, I want that person to marry, I just want all these things. And when's the last time we just sat and we prayed and we wept and we fasted before the Lord over our sin and others. Nehemiah shows us that he was trustworthy. God, I believe, saw, just as he saw young David out in the field. It's who you are when no one's looking that's the real you. And God saw that he could trust Nehemiah. Before there's activity for God, there must first be intimacy with God. Our activity is to overflow from intimacy. I served on staff at a great church. I don't come from a line of pastors. I don't have a lineage. My father left me when I was three years old. My grandparents stepped in and pretty much helped secure me and helped influence my life. My grandfather was a truck driver for Kroger. My grandmother, a seamstress for Sears. Faithfully over 50 years at a church in Memphis called Lee Claire Baptist Church. My grandfather would wake up every Sunday morning and write the tithe check and take my grandmother's hand and walk across the street to the church house and serve the Lord. I grew up most of my life in small churches. For whatever reason, God allowed me to serve on staff at a great church in Memphis called Kirby Woods Baptist Church, doing collegiate ministry and evangelism for the church. I had a nice Nice job. Uh, I had two secretaries. I had an office with matching cherry wood furniture. I was so happy. Dr. Moeller, everything matched and went together. And I knew what happened if you went and planted a church that you got furniture that didn't match and nobody wanted. I knew exactly what was ahead of me if I was to follow the Lord and go plant a church. God was calling me to 
In essence, Dr. Al Jackson came and preached at our church on the cost of following Jesus. And I don't remember the three points of his sermon, but I do remember the second point to which he said, the cost of following Jesus could mean a change of plans for your life. And Jennifer and I knew at that moment that God was calling us. He was calling us out of Memphis. And people began to come to me when I began to make that known. And they began to say things like, why would you leave Memphis? This is your home. You're loved here. Don't, don't you know that the pastor is going to be retiring soon? And don't you know about Ohio? And I said, no, I don't know about Ohio. What, what is it? And they said, well, it snows up there. And it's cold. And they said, you don't have, there, there's no barbecue and sweet tea in Ohio. How are you going to survive? Can I tell you, when we moved to Marysville, there was only one restaurant serving sweet tea, and when we left, there was five to the glory of God, all right? The gospel <laughs> multiplied, and so did sweet tea. But I began to wrestle every Sunday morning during the invitation as we would sing the song, Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. And I knew the Lord was calling us out and to go. There in my office, in one of those moments when you're having time with the Lord, it's almost like the Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart in my office there at Kirby Woods and just said, you know, Jeremy, you're more interested, I feel like, in your kingdom than you are mine. So why don't you just stay here in Memphis and I'll find somebody else to go to Ohio. And that just riveted my heart. And I knew I was disobedient. And there in my office, I repented and I asked the Lord to forgive me. And I said, God, if you'll let me go, if you'll give me one more chance, I'll go to Ohio and we'll pack up everything and, we, and go. And God said, sell it and get it all out and go. And we left. And at that time, the recession of 2007, 2008 was hitting. You remember that time? We couldn't sell homes. You could take a baseball and walk out on our front step and, and there would be eight homes for sale. Even the Christian realtor in our church called me and said, Jeremy, I can't sell your home. Now, when the Christian realtor calls you, that's bad and says he can't sell your home. And he said, only God can sell your home right now. And you know, with a few weeks to go, God did. I stood before our team there at our church and they said, what are you gonna do if you can't sell the home and go plant the church? I said, God will do it. God will do it and trust. That uh, afternoon, we got a phone call that someone was gonna purchase our home. People all around us in our subdivision were taking loans out to sell their home. And that afternoon, I got a call, and we went to sell our home. And can I tell you, we didn't have to take a loan out to sell our home. By the end of the day, when we closed, I think we made $47 on the house. I took my wife, and I said, we're going to Outback, sweetheart, and I'm going to buy you a steak, and now I'll even throw in an appetizer, okay? I mean, it was the best $47 I ever made in my life. It was a small moment where God reminded me, trust me trust me but God had to see that he could trust Nehemiah and God had to see that he could trust me as well how can we know what we know and still do what we do as pastor Johnny Hunt says it's not the truth we know but the truth we obey that changes us it's great to study and it's great to read it's great to write notes but it's not the truth that we just know intellectually it's the truth that we obey that changes who we are as we walk and step in obedience no doubt the days will come where God's gonna be calling you and leading you to different states, to different countries, locally, nationally, and internationally, as you walk with him. Live in such a way that God can see and trust you with his gospel, with his resources, with his calling upon your life. There will be moments of temptation, but God saw that he could trust, and God had to see that he could trust me. So the truth is, if we can trust God with our lives eternally, why can't we trust him daily? We're standing on the promises. We are believing and saying that when we die, when we breathe our last, and we will, we will be before the Lord, and that will be all that matters. It's what we've done with Christ and his gospel. But if we can trust him with our lives eternally, surely we can trust him daily. God saw that he could trust Nehemiah. Number two, God spared Nehemiah's life. Now, we flip a page. You scroll up your phone or your iPad from chapter one to chapter two, but four months pass by. Four months pass, Nehemiah is waiting on the Lord. Some of you today, no doubt, you're waiting on the Lord. You're waiting for God's timing. Somebody once told me this, said, Jeremy, it's just as much a sin to get ahead of the will of God as it is not to do it. Nehemiah was waiting. He was waiting on the Lord. He was weeping. He was praying. He was fasting. Nehemiah understood that intimacy came before activity. And now is the moment God was calling him 
And it's miraculous in chapter two, God spares his life. It says when wine was before him, and we all know as students here that he was a cupbearer. We need no long explanation here of his job and his role. God was elevated, uh, Nehemiah, he was a cupbearer before the king, a, a position of high trust. But even so, he was still waiting, and he said, I took the wine and I gave it to the king, and I had never been sad in his presence. Verse two, so the king said to me, why do you look so sad? Why aren't you sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. He said, I was overwhelmed with fear. And the king replied, may the king, and I said, I replied to the king, may the king live forever. I bet he did. His life was on the line. He said, why should I not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king asked me, what is your request? And what did he do? He prayed over and over and over in this book. Nehemiah's resounding theme was prayer and fasting and intimacy with the Father. Students, you will always go back to that. You will continually, throughout your ministry journey on this side of eternity, continually be going back, no matter what position God puts you in, is intimacy with the Father. Don't ever get over the gospel. Don't ever get over being saved. Never get over it. That was Paul's secret of his ministry. He never got over his salvation. Here's Nehemiah. God spares him. God spares his life. Why? Why is this so miraculous? This moment that he gets to live. Because what was the penalty to be before a king with sadness of heart and no just cause? It was death. The fact that we even have a rest of chapter two and the rest of a book is miraculous to me. God spares Nehemiah's life. God began to do so many things in our life to get us on our journey from Tennessee to Ohio. As the Lord uh, sold our home, we began to sell everything that we had. We sold both of our cars. We sold our dog. Um, that dog was a biter, so we didn't think that was a good plan for planning a church. Um, but we sold everything we had and we kept our kid. Caden was two years old at the time and we decided to keep Caden and sold it all and moved north. God spares his life. Number three, God sends Nehemiah on his journey. God sends him on his journey journey. Look at verses five and six. I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servants found favor with you, send me to Judah. Send me to Judah and to the city where my ancestors are, bur ancestors are buried so that I may rebuild it. And the king with the queen seated beside him asked, how long will your journey take and when will you return? Miraculous. Miraculous. God spares his life and sends him on his journey. He shouldn't be alive at this moment. But he's waiting on the Lord, he's weeping, he's praying, he's fasting, even when the king calls upon him. What does he do? He prays. Intimacy with the Father. And he sends him on his journey. Not only does Nehemiah get to live, he gets to live sent. He sends him on his journey. God did everything for us in a miraculous way. Sends us on our journey. We're driving through the hills of Kentucky. When you're driving a U-Haul, they put this little thing on it called a governor and make sure that you can't go very, very fast. And so there's nothing more frustrating than having a U-Haul full of furniture going through the hills of Kentucky at 45 miles an hour. And I was driving up through the interstate, leaving through Nashville to Kentucky up to Ohio. My wife in our minivan called me with our two-year-old in the car and she said, Jeremy, I can't take this anymore. I'll see you in Ohio. And there my wife left me in the dust and I saw my white Dodge Caravan driving off with my two-year-old right before me leaving me and I said, Lord, here I am in a U-Haul, it's just you and I. And I said, I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. And I prayed and I said, God, you're sending us and I'm trusting you. God, keep us in a position, keep us in a place where only you can receive the credit and you can get the glory for. And be careful what you pray because you just might get it. And God sends Nehemiah on his journey. God began to send families from all over the country to help us plant our church, people that I didn't even know. One family even came from Alaska and came down to help us plant this church, this gospel work there outside of Columbus, Ohio. God began to do so much. 
I can remember the miraculous moments. Oftentimes people would say, Jeremy, write them down. And unfortunately I was so busy I forgot to write many things down, but some things I remember, like one day being at a car wash there in our city, washing cars for people and uh, sharing the gospel and washing cars and people coming by. And one guy, he came down the road and he almost hit a telephone pole and he didn't and he came around and he got out of his car and there's just some folks when they get out of the car, they rise. And when this gentleman got out of the car, he ro- the car rose and he got out and he's, I thought, man, that's guy, he's an instant security guard for me at the church. He was a big guy. He gets out of the car and he says, who's the pastor of this church? And I looked at my youth guy and I said, him, he's the guy. (laughs) And the guy said, no, he's the pastor. So he comes over to me and he says, sir, uh, what are you doing here? I said, well, we're just washing cars and proclaiming the gospel about our new church here in Marysville, Ohio. And uh, he said, are you going to preach the Bible? And I said, yes, sir. He said, do you believe in missions? I said, yes, sir. That's why I'm here. We believe in missions. And he said, well, I about ran off the road. I said, well, I could see that, you know, and, but glad you didn't. And um, he says, we are moving from Bowling Green, Kentucky, and we're members of a church called Living Hope Baptist Church. And we've been praying for a church to attend here in Ohio that'll preach the word and believe in missions. And we saw your sign on the road that says Living Hope Church, and, and I just couldn't believe it. And it was stories after like that over and over and over of God sending us confirmation of what God did in our lives. Dr. Adrian Rogers said, the will of God will never lead you or the grace of God cannot keep you. Intimacy with the Father. Nehemiah believes and he trusts and he waited upon the Lord. God saw that he could trust him. God spares his life and he sends him on his journey. And number four, God supplies his need and vision. Look at verses seven and eight. I also said to the king, if it pleases the king, let me have letters written to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates, so they will grant me safe passage until I reach Judah. And let me have a letter written to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so that he will give me timber to rebuild the gates of the temple's fortress, the city wall and the home where I will live. And the king granted my request, for the gracious hand of my God was upon me. You see this morning, there is no secret sauce to ministry. There is no secret. The secret sauce to life and ministry ultimately is the hand of God to be upon your life and ministry. And that is it. Nehemiah says, nothing that happened I can take credit for. He says, all that has taken place has been the hand of the Father. But where where was it birthed? Where where did it start? It started in prayer and weeping and fasting. Prayer must not be our last resort. It must be our first stop. God trusted Nehemiah and spared him and sends him and then supplies everything he needs. It is a miraculous story. It is a miracle that we even have the rest of this book. Wherever God guides, he provides, and whatever he orders, he pays for. I don't have time to tell you the story of our church campus, how the Lord miraculously provided for us in less than a year for us to purchase and renovate our campus debt-free to the glory of God, but he did it all by his hand. Students, you are where you are by the grace of God and for the glory of God. The grass isn't always greener right where you are, it's where you water it. It's where you are faithful. What you need is not more money in the bank and more degrees on the wall and more influence on social media. What we need is the hand of God to be upon our life in ministry. Many of you will head to the courtroom to practice law. You will head to the classroom to teach students. You will walk in the church house to the pulpit to exegete the text and to proclaim the gospel. Wherever God leads you, someone's waiting on the other side of your obedience. I told you that my father left when I was three years old. In 2010, a year into our church planning journey, he found me on the internet 
and began listening to sermons and he reached out to me. And he said, I'd love to see you. I'll be honest this morning, I was not happy. I was filled with bitterness and hurt and pain. Why did you leave me? And why do you now want me? The Lord once again spoke to my heart. I said, Jeremy, if you can preach forgiveness but can't expend, ex extend it, you should take a break from preaching. My wife, far godlier than I, she said, Jeremy, the gospel is on display right now. And I responded back to him through email. I said, I'd love to see you as well. Let's meet for dinner. We met for dinner the next night, and it was awkward as it could be. But he paid for dinner. That was a good start. And so when you're a church planner, <laughs> that's always a good thing. I said to him, hey, uh, would you love to meet your grandkids? He said, I thought you never asked that. I said, neither did I. He comes out the next night traveling through the snow to our home, and there is my five-year-old son and my one-year-old daughter there in the living room on the Nintendo Wii playing Mario Kart. And I looked at my wife and I said, what is happening? She said, the gospel is happening. My dad comes to church that Sunday. We're meeting in a school. If you're an athlete, you know what it's like before a big game, how you feel. That's how I felt before that day, getting up to preach the truth of the gospel. I asked my dad afterwards, I said, how'd you like it? He said, I loved it. I could drink coffee, wear jeans, and I liked your worship band. I said, that's a good start. He came back six months later. Once again, get up, preach. Dad, how'd you like it? And it was that day that my dad made peace with God. And it was that day that my dad made peace with me. And now I have an earthly father, someone to call and to pray with and to pray to. Five years ago when God called us out of Ohio to move to Clearwater, Florida, first person I called was my dad. And nine months ago when the committee called me about coming back to Ohio, the first person I called was my dad. I would have never dreamed 13, 14 years ago that God was calling me out of Memphis, Tennessee to Marysville, Ohio to reach my own father. I thought I was going to plant a church. And in God's sovereign grace, he also had some other plans along the way. Someone's waiting on the other side of your obedience. The only thing worse than being lost is to be lost and to no one be looking for you. Come to Ohio. There's 12 million people. There's a great need in Ohio. And there's a lot of people that are searching and looking for how to get the most out of life. And we have the answers found in the Gospels. But we need feet on the ground to come herald the truth, to share, to disciple, to plant, to revitalize to advance the Great Commission. Never get over being saved. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, thank you so much for the honor and the joy to be here this hour. Lord, I pray that as we train, as we study, as we read, as we prepare, keep our hearts warm May we stay humble before you, pursuing holiness, hot after the things that you've called us to do. Remind us that someone's waiting on the other side of our obedience. May we walk with you. May you find us trustworthy. Remind us, Father, that life is short, eternity is long. May we invest and steward well. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.